During the first hour, we have a very interesting guest whom I'm so glad to have here. It is Mr. James Bobard, and the subject will be that which is covered by his latest book called Terrorism and Tyranny. And he will be with us right through to the top of the next hour. And we will limit phone calls during this first hour to anything relating to the war on terrorism, its causes and effects, and anything related thereto. James Bovard has written a number of books, and my favorite so far, I guess it's because it's the only one that I've read all the way through, is Lost Rights. And I quoted from it when I wrote my book, Why Government Doesn't Work, and I found a great deal of good material in there about asset forfeiture and other things that our federal government has done to take away our civil liberties. And he's written a number of other books, but this new one really looks fascinating. I ordered it from Amazon, and I have not had the chance to go through it, but I will put it near the head of the line because there's so much in it that relates to the book I'm writing on war right now. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I especially like the subtitle of the book. It is Terrorism and Tyranny, Trampling Freedom, Justice, and Peace to Rid the World of Evil. So, without further ado, let me introduce James Bovard. Good evening, Jim. Hey, Harry. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. Jim, I have been trying not to read this book <laughs> until I finish what I'm immediately concerned with right now, but I keep picking it up and glancing at things. And one of the chapters that really jumped out on me is really the first chapter, which is entitled America's First War on Terrorism, and it points out that this latest one is not the first war on terrorism. And maybe that's a good place for us to start because maybe – that earlier war on terrorism, along with a lot of other things, have the seeds in it of the current war on terrorism. So give us a little summary of that, if you would. Well, when, uh, back when Reg President Reagan uh, took office back in uh, January 81, he made terrorism a very big priority. It was his second biggest uh, foreign policy priority after uh, the Soviet Union, and uh, he revved up the uh, rhetoric immensely on that. They changed some of their measures to double the number of apparent terrorist attacks simply by a circuit shell game. Uh, and it was uh, anti-terrorism was a major reason why the U.S. got dragged into the Middle East uh, while the U.S. sent troops to Beirut in late 1982, uh, those troops got slaughtered the following year by a, a, a car, a, a truck bomb, suicide truck bomber. And it was interesting seeing the type of reaction that the Reagan and others had after hundreds of U.S. Marines had been killed in a suicide attack, which, uh, you know, which, which they were very poorly defended against. Uh, Reagan and others basically insisted that the U.S. was blameless, that they had no way of anticipating this type of attack, that they were blindsided, even though these type of terrorist attacks had been occurring in Beirut, which was riven by a civil war, that had been going on for eight, uh, seven or eight years. It was also driven by the Syrian army, by the Israeli army. The, the place was a complete mess. The U.S. stuck troops in there expecting it would be a panacea, uh, a little bit similar to what we're doing in Iraq right now. I mean, uh, there seemed to be some people who thought that simply having troops go there and raise the American flag would make everybody get along. Uh, it didn't happen. A lot of Americans died, and nothing was accomplished. Well, you know, I think part of the reason that Reagan uh, made the war on terrorism, so-called, uh, priority was because as he was about to be inaugurated, they just finally released the American hostages in Tehran after how long was it? About 15 months? Yeah, I've forgotten the uh, you know I've forgotten the Walter Cronkite countdown on that. But, uh, <laughs> no, I thought know. it was Ted Koppel. Today yeah. is day whatever of uh, the hostage crisis. Yeah, but yeah, that was a, a major uh, impetus for that. But it's kind of curious because that was not really uh, you know there's a, you know a, a major problem I have with the U.S. war on terrorism is how terrorism is defined. And the U.S. government defines terrorism basically as uh, private action by private individuals or private groups or private uh, conspiracies. Actions of government are almost never considered to be terrorism. And yet, if you look at what the U.S. State Department says, the State Department says that in the 1980s and 1990s, worldwide, about 8,000 individuals were killed by, uh, uh, by international terrorist groups. During the same two decades, governments killed over 10 million people around the world. Governments killed over 1,000 times as many people uh, as the terrorists, and yet the Bush uh, global war on terrorism basically um, is uh, built on the uh, premise that the, uh, that the private terrorists are the, are the greatest threat to humanity. And that is, you know, the uh, numbers show different. Well, that's a, an interesting point, and probably the reason for that is simply that 3,000 of the people that were killed were American citizens in one act, and no politician could possibly say, well, that's unfortunate, now let's move on and forget about it. Yeah, and, and, you know, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm glad the U.S. government is focused on al-Qaeda. The, the, it's vital the U.S. go after al-Qaeda to wipe out al-Qaeda to make sure al-Qaeda never strikes the U.S. again. But part of the trouble I had with the Bush war on terrorism is that it's, uh, Bush, Bush talks at times as if any terrorist group or any terrorist anywhere should be considered an enemy of the U.S. And uh, that's the kind of mindset which results in endless foreign meddling, and it greatly dissipates our ability to concentrate our scarce resources on al-Qaeda, which is the uh, real threat, which is the group that killed thousands of Americans. Instead, we're uh, you know, uh, chasing around the Philippines or putting people in, um, all over the world and, and not going after the number one threat. That's a very good point, and I haven't heard anybody mention that before, at least that I can recall. Uh, a good example of this is saying that one of the reasons to go uh, attack Iraq 
was because Iraq sponsors terrorism. But to the best of our knowledge, Iraq, or at least let me say the best of my knowledge, Iraq has not sponsored terrorism against the United States. And if you call somebody on that point, the answer you get is, well, what do you think those suicide bombers in Israel were who were getting rewards for their families from Saddam Hussein? All right, call those terrorist acts. Let's assume that every bit of uh, propaganda we've heard about it is true. It still was not an attack on the United States. It was an attack on Israel. And that's a private quarrel that's been going on for over 50 years and will probably go on for at least another 50 years. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is most unfortunate that Bush was, was able to uh, uh, scam the U.S. into a war, into an unnecessary foreign war. I mean, Bush made so many false statements on the road to war, but something was really uh, stuck in my ear in, uh, in January and February of this year. Bush, in a number of speeches, uh, would uh, start out by saying, if war, if war is forced upon us, then America will fight, so on and so forth. If war is forced upon us. And every time I heard that phrase, I just said, you know, this is nonsense, because uh, there is no foreign government that's forcing war on the American people. If anybody, it's George Bush's administration and, and the uh, false statements and lies and the threats. I mean, it was a classic case of a president fear-mongering of people in the war, which has happened too many times in American history. Yeah, a lot of people have referred to it as bait and switch. You know, talk about 9-11, and then the next thing you know, we're talking about Iraq. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. And the thirst for revenge, of course, is very natural in human beings. It's a, it's a very difficult emotion to try to stifle in oneself, uh, resentment, revenge, all of these things. And there usually is this feeling that I've got to lash out at somebody, and I don't really care who it is. That's why vigilantes and lynch mobs are outlawed because they, the victim of the vigilantes or the lynch mob has not had his day in court where you can actually prove that this is the person you really want to be mad at. And, of course, that's what we're having, having here. They went out and bombed Afghanistan, and everybody breathed a sigh of relief, and Bush tried to trade on that with Iraq and perhaps was less successful. And one of the good things I think that's happened, one of the few good things, is that I think it uh, is not going to be very easy now for him to attack Syria or Iran or somebody else, no matter what kind of saber-rattling they do, because people are getting a little tired of it. And I would have thought before the war in Iraq started, that it would be very easy to drum up hatred against Iran and Syria and some of the others, and this was just going to go on right through the 2004 election, and then we might get a respite from it. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. It's, I mean, it's my impression that the, uh, a number of the, uh, uh, the Pentagon people did want to uh, you know, do their own domino uh, game in the Middle East, but uh, from, from what I'm reading of the uh, situation of the U.S. troops in Iraq, uh, I think most of the active uh, duty U.S. Um, US Army uh, divisions, uh, combat divisions, are already there in Iraq, and, and uh, they're getting worn down. I mean, not so much with heavy casualties, but there's massive amounts of equipment failure. So many things are going wrong. People are getting uh, exhausted and often ill. Uh, it's, you know, it's, um, it's not a pretty picture. Yeah, and that's good. Good from the standpoint that anything that puts the brakes on this mad rush to go to war is dandy with me. Uh, the, one of the problems that I've mentioned on this show before is that Bush, Bush's credibility has suffered so much that if we really did have a threat, from a foreign country where America really was in danger of being attacked and the Bush administration started telling us about it, I would find it very hard to believe, and I think that there are millions of Americans now who would find it hard to believe. I should mention two things about the books and Jim's books in general before we go to the phone. First of all, he is a, an inveterate researcher. Uh, his books are full of facts and figures, and he digs out all of this stuff. And when I was about to write Why Government Doesn't Work back in 1994, I called him up and asked him if he would do research for me in my book, but he had better things to do. But uh, it really is an excellent place to get a lot of information. And secondly, he's an excellent writer. You'll find it very, very engrossing, very easy to follow. You don't keep rereading sentences trying to figure out exactly what the meaning was. And with that said, let's go now to Jacob in Syracuse and see what's on your mind tonight, Jacob. Good evening, Jacob. Hi. Um, I just had a couple points to ask um, Mr. Goldberg. Sure. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to tell him that I just ordered his book off Amazon, and I'm very much, I'm very happy that I ordered it, and I'm really glad that it's coming. And it looks very good from the reviews that I've read, and the price is very good too. And I would just like to ask him what he thinks about the whole Bush policy, with regard that what Bush is saying that we must go into Iraq to pursue the weapons of destruction, and then he completely lied about that, and then he changed his argument after the fact to say that we were liberating the people, but in essence, with liberating the people, he killed and. Un uncountable number of civilians. And then um, after the uh, aftermath of Iraq, what he thinks we should do to get hopefully towards a non-interventionist policy where America doesn't threaten anyone. What do you say, Jim? Well, uh, first, thanks for your very uh, thanks for uh, Jack, thanks for your very kind comments on the book, uh, and uh, thanks for buying it. Um, you know, uh, that's a very good point about uh, Bush, Bush and Iraq. Americans have got to recognize that killing foreigners is no substitute for protecting Americans. And Bush has sold this war in Iraq. Uh, he has often talked about how it's important to fight the terrorists there instead of fight them here. I mean, uh, Bush's policy presumes that there's a finite number of terrorists in the world, and all we have to do is find them and uh, squash them. However, uh, uh, Bush's policies 
are likely creating more terrorists than the U.S. is vanquishing. And uh, that's obvious, I think, in the rising number of attacks on American troops and on the U.N. and on the uh, Jordanian embassy and other targets there in Iraq. I mean, um, it's interesting to think back one year ago, uh, U.S. troops were not were not suffering terrorist attacks every day. U.S. troops were, uh, people were not shooting at them and blowing them up, and there were not, uh, you know, five or ten or more wounded uh, practically every day. And uh, far too many killed. I mean, uh, this is a complete disaster as far as anti-terrorism goes because um, the uh, Pentagon may be fantasizing that they'll be able to squash the terrorist threat, but there's there's 24 million people there, uh, 24, 25 million people in Iraq alone, and many of those folks are getting more angry every week at the American occupation. Yeah, the skilling of the eight Iraqi policemen on Friday really stirred up a hornet's nest, and people are really ch- starting to chant, America, go home, America, go home. Well, it's regular bison. We should, uh, you know, <laughs> we should accept their invitation. Yes, they seem to know a lot more about it than our leaders do. Yeah, uh, well, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's sort of grading on a curve when you come, you know, because, <laughs> you know, I don't know when Mr. Bush gets his information. Uh, you know, I have to wonder if it just, you know, uh, it, it seems so incestuous as far as, you know, what the people, you know, what the top people in the uh, Bush administration say in public. It's just, you know, uh, it makes me think that none of them ever read the New York Times or the Washington Post or, uh, or other good newspapers. Even USA Today has got better coverage and analysis of a lot of this stuff than does the uh, Bush administration. And also there seems to be a woeful lack of knowledge about history, about the context in which these things happen, and about the history of the people that you're dealing with. It's as though these people are all a blank slate. We go in there and say some nice things, and they will, of course, uh, roll over and play dead for us, and it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, well, yeah, and it's, you know, the uh, ignorance that uh, Bush and other top people showed before the war, during the war, and, uh, you know, still ongoing. I mean, it's just... Uh, this arrogance is uh, 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 this arrogance has already proven fatal for a lot of good American soldiers. As far as the uh, the first aspect of this question, uh, as far as preventing future terrorist attacks, uh, it's important to recognize that 9/11 did not make the federal government more competent. There's been a lot of resources poured in a lot of these agencies, and in, in some ways, it's good the FBI is concentrating more on terrorist threats and the CIA as well. And there've been some marginal reforms on immigration policy that have had some positive aspects. But overall, government is still going to be doing government work. You really can't rely on uh, that much. And that's why I think that the uh, best anti-terrorism policy is to make fewer foreign enemies, which means that the U.S. should be uh, doing less intervening. The, uh, uh, you know, I think it would be real helpful if we bombed fewer foreign countries. Uh, we have bombed so many. Uh, we've, we've bombed a lot of countries over the last uh, five years, most of whom uh, we had no right at all to, to interfere in their business. Uh, and uh, it, as far as presidents, is, uh, preventing presidents from, uh, from exploiting these kind of things, uh, citizens should distrust politicians who distrust freedom. It is vital for American citizens to do a better job of being American citizens. Folks were so gullible after 9-11, the uh, public opinion polls show that the number of Americans who trusted the government to do the right thing doubled in the weeks after 9-11. But that was partly because the uh, U.S. government misled the American people about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, warnings they'd received, their foreknowledge of possible uh, a terrorist conspiracy to hijack airliners and use them as weapons. There was, uh, there, were, uh, there was so many different ways that the U.S. government misled the American people after 9-11, and some ways the American people are still being, there's a lot of information still being withheld, which would be real helpful to find out what it was. Well, I think that high approval rating for government right after 9-11 was partly just the feeling of vulnerability people had, and so it was wishful thinking. I think you're right, yeah. Uh, because if the government is going to protect us, then who is? And I've got to have faith in my government. If I don't, I'm really up a creek, or at least that was the thinking. But as you point out, that's the last place to have faith because government's record of incompetence is just overwhelming, whether it is protecting against terrorists, uh, whether it is bringing liberty to other countries, or domestic matters, the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on illiteracy, the war on on war, (laughs) all these things have been uh, total failures. Eric uh, sends us an email and asks, why do you suppose that we are so locked in on the side of Israel? In the L.A. Times, which I guess is where Eric is, every single act against Israel is front page as though it were Americans that had been attacked. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, there are a lot of Americans uh, who have a great sympathy with Israel, uh, I think in part because of the Holocaust, uh, the, the terrible suffering of the Jewish people. Um, and there's, uh, there are a lot of Americans who think that the, uh, think that U.S. aid and intervention is going to make, Israel, make Israelis safe. Uh, I had a chapter in the book on, on, the, uh, on the Israeli method of fighting terrorism, and I walked through a lot of the details of Israeli policies, and the, um, some of the policies have been very aggressive, and yet they have failed to protect the Israeli people. Uh, since, since Ariel Sharon became prime minister, more Israelis have been killed by terrorist attacks than were killed than the soldiers lost during the Six-Day War in 1967. Uh, uh, that's a really good point. And when people say the only thing those terrorists or those whoever understand is force, all they have to do is look at Israel. Israel has used force to try to solve its problems, and all they've gotten in return is more force than before. And you could say the same thing about the Palestinians. They think they're going to solve their problems with force, and all they get is more force in return. There's a 50-year history there, a failure on both sides to be able to do anything to solve the problems that they face. Yeah, I mean, it's a complete mess at this point. If Palestinian suicide bombers are not freedom fighters. They're terrorists. I don't want there to be any uncertainty on that. Uh, it's just, it's unfortunate when both sides have, uh, when, uh, you know, a vast number of civilians on both sides have been killed by the other people on the other side. It's just, 
And it's obvious that, the, you know, uh, as far as I can tell, nothing that the U.S. has done in that, in that part of the world since Jimmy Carter and the Camp David Peace Accord in 1978, nothing has really fundamentally moved things forward. Yet we poured hundreds of billions of dollars of aid into that area and, uh, you know, and, and poured vast amounts of arms, and uh, we have nothing to show for it. Yeah, very good. One other question before we go back to the phones. What kind of a job do you think John Ashcroft is doing? I can't ask the question with a straight face. Ashcroft is, you know, uh, Ashcroft has done a great job of entertainment value. I mean, he's someone who actually had a much better than average record for respecting privacy when he was a U.S. senator. He had a, 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 an op-ed he wrote in 1997 in which he scorned Clinton administration proposals for surveillance, saying saying that Americans don't need a big brother government to read all their email. <laughs> but, he, but see, Clinton was a Democrat. Clinton was a Democrat, and he was liberal, and even worse, he had sex. <laughs> you know, so, you know, obviously he was not trustworthy. Uh, but uh, but Ashcroft came into power, and, uh, you know, Ashcroft completely browbeat Congress with the Patriot Act, stamping them uh, thoroughly. And there's so many things in the Patriot Act that are so much worse than what most Americans think. There's this, uh, there's the, the carnivore email surveillance program in which, in which the FBI can get a search warrant to attract one person's email. It goes in there with this black box called carnivore. It forces the Internet, ser- uh, the Internet service provider to attach that to their software. And if FBI can hit a single switch and automatically capture all of the email of all of the customers using that Internet service provider. So FBI can have a search warrant to one person. Voila, they have 100,000 people's email. Wow. I didn't realize that. I, I knew that they had programs for monitoring email, but I didn't realize that that was the mechanism. Uh, it's a vacuum. It's a vacuum, but, but uh, Congress and – well, and, and, uh, something that's very frustrating is under the Patriot Act, the uh, Justice Department got all these new surveillance powers, and they are refusing to tell even Congress in confidential uh, you know, uh, transmissions how many Americans are being spied on by the government now. Uh, because there's been a vast increase in surveillance and searches and black bag searches and no not in uh, secret searches. And yet uh, the uh, government is not willing to tell how many Americans' privacy is being violated. And as you say, they're not even willing to tell on a classified basis to key congressmen. And uh, I don't believe that any congressman could tell you how many people are currently being detained by the federal government on well, I was going to say terrorist charges, but they're not charged with anything. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, there are some people who, who were uh, grabbed after 9-11 and being held as material witnesses, which is a very fuzzy legal concept in how, as far as how the Bush administration is doing it, because, um, you know, um, it's all, uh, during the month after 9-11, it was understandable that after 9-11 there would be heightened scrutiny and heightened, heightened suspicion of Arab and Muslim males. I mean, that was uh, human nature. Bush made some good statements uh, at that time that not all Arabs and uh, Muslims should be suspected. But Ashcroft turned up the heat on the FBI to go out and grab and interrogate uh, basically as, uh, as many males of certain ages from uh, certain countries, primarily Arab and Muslim, uh, as possible. They're pressuring them hard during the uh, questioning. And uh, FBI agents were under so much pressure that they would even use the telephone books to find Arab and Muslim names who they could come in and call in and question. Hoping to get anything out of them. Well, it was all... them until the pips week. Well, it was, it was a numbers game. It, you know, it was like the Soviet potato harvest. It didn't matter that almost all the potatoes were rotten as long as, long as I could say, you know, we had 10 billion bushels this year. We did great. <laughs> That's right. Well, they've had a lot of practice. Yes. Uh, let's go back to the phones and talk with Jonathan in Washington, D.C. Good evening, Jonathan. Good evening, Harry. Uh, James, I'm glad to be on with you. I've read a bunch of your books, and I always find them well-researched and well-written, so uh, I'm, I'm glad to be able to speak to you now. Hey, thanks. Uh, um, I, I want to say briefly first that I was in uh, Capitol Hill office building the other day on an errand, and outside one of the congressmen's office, I was struck by he had this poster outside, right outside of his office with a picture of the, of the World Trade Center uh, on fire and smoking. And uh, at the bottom it said something like, remember who started it, or something like that. <laughs> and uh, I, I, just the fact that this is outside a U.S. Congress member's office, I would just struck me. And, it, and it, you know, it's like you said so many times before, Harry, that you know, they, so many people think that history just started on 9-11, and, and you know, nothing, nothing was going on in the world before that. Um, but uh, anyway, I want to ask you a question, uh, James. I heard you had just started a show say that you um, supported U.S. government efforts to root out al-Qaeda cells. All over the world, which is a position I well, think has been taken. Well, 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 hold on, okay, sure. my question, okay. um, which is a position I think has been taken by the Cato Institute and other libertarian uh, sources. But I'm kind of concerned about that. In my opinion, the people who actually perpetrated these heinous attacks are dead. Um, to the extent that Osama bin Laden financed them, he should be apprehended. But saying that the government should go around, the, I think there are dozens of Al Qaeda cells all over the world, and that just seems to me like opening up another more potential for, for government abuses and intervention, and I'd like another you to comment on that, and, and Harry, if you could comment on that too, I'd like that too. Okay, yeah, that's a very good question, I'd, I'd like to clarify my, my earlier comments. Okay, I, I, I was saying that the U.S. should go after Al Qaeda, and just kind of you know, put them out of business, business lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, I, I don't know who it was, either Rumsfeld or someone else spoke at some, at some point, maybe in late 2001, about there being, uh, being Al Qaeda cells in 50 countries. That was not what I was thinking of. I mean, what I was thinking of is that, okay, there is, you know, uh, there's a, uh, 
probably a, 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 a limited number of folks. And, you know, uh, to, you know, to talk an example, what I would not support, what I do not agree with, if you look at what happened in the, in the Lackawanna case up there in Buffalo, there were uh, five or six or so uh, Muslim guys who had visited briefly a, uh, a, a camp in Afghanistan and came back and did not do anything, basically. But they were rounded up. There was a high-profile prosecution. They, there was intense pressure on these guys, and, and the, the government eventually got guilty pleas, which probably saved the government from complete embarrassment if the case ever went to trial. Uh, but I am, you know, I mean, I, what I'm thinking of is, a, you know, is a very specific, uh, non-expansive concept of who al-Qaeda is. And just because someone went to a training camp or, or you know, someone got an email, whatever, these, uh, these folks are not necessarily the enemy. Do you have any thoughts about whether our government should be going into foreign countries looking for al-Qaeda cells? It's a tough question, I know. Yeah. I'm not enthusiastic on the U.S. Army or, or the U.S. military trampling all over the world because uh, that has generated so much ill will. And uh, I, think, I think one of the clearest lessons of what happened in, in Beirut is that we put a lot of troops there, and all of a sudden it becomes a magnet for terrorists. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Well, you don't have to know everything, Jim. Okay. You, are, you already know quite a lot. I should mention, incidentally, we were talking about Ashcroft. There's a great deal in the book about what's in the Patriot Act and some of these other things rather than just the kind of generalizations we've heard here, there, and everywhere else. I'm correct about that, aren't I? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and it has over 2,000 footnotes. Uh, something which I did when I was writing this is uh, I try to read all of Bush's speeches and interviews at 9-11. And I, well, I, you I, really do work for us. Well, I've been a masochist for many years. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Thank you, Jonathan, for your call. And uh, Jim, you uh, mentioned off the air that you had some material in the book about the bastardization of language that's taken place, and I think that that's a very interesting subject that people probably have noticed and not really put their finger on. So if you would, would you give us a little insight on that? Well, it's interesting how Bush has framed this war on terrorism as simply being a question about freedom. Uh, on, on, the, uh, on the evening of 9-11, when he was back in the uh, White House, finally back in the White House after his uh, tour around the country, after his trip around the country, uh, Bush, said, uh, Bush said effectively that, uh, that the reason these people had, had attacked the U.S. was because they hate freedom. Now, it struck me as curious that Bush knew the motive of the attackers even before the CIA knew who the attackers were. That's a really good point. I have never thought about that before. I always thought it was a stupid remark, but it never occurred to me. How in the world could he even presume to know this? Well, I mean, Bush made a decision early on to frame the entire conflict as a, uh, uh, as a conflict for freedom and a war for freedom, and therefore everything that the government did in the war on terrorism automatically becomes pro-freedom. Right, as they take your freedoms away from you, it's for your freedom. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's the, uh, and there are so many different ways that uh, Bush has tried to frame the issues in order to completely shut off people's thinking. For instance, uh, Bush loved to uh, tell people that, it was, uh, that they had a, that it's freedom to be with us or else. I mean, uh, you know, basically, either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Uh, either you stand for freedom or you stand for tyranny if you're against this. Um, either, uh, uh, either you love freedom or you stand against the USA in, in another speech. You know, and this is plain and simple nonsense. Sure. There, you know, there are there are a lot of people who uh, who uh, who like freedom, but for some reason don't like the U.S. or maybe don't like George Bush or current American policies. There's you know there are lots of people in Europe, in Northern Europe right now, who intensely uh, dislike Bush, but have no desire to uh, live under a Muslim theocracy. Yeah, how true. And people trying to divine the motives of the French, for instance, in opposing the U.S., I mean, was it their commercial interests in Iraq? Are they decadent? Is it this or is it that? Never considered was they just may think that Bush is doing the wrong thing, as tens of millions of Americans think, and you don't need an ulterior motive. Just take it at face value. But as you say, everything is either or. There are only two alternatives. And, of course, anything that comes up, there are many possible alternatives. But framing it that way, it puts his opponents on the defensive. Oh, well, then you're, you're for Saddam Hussein, right? There was a, an interview that I saw on television uh, where Aaron Brown of uh, CNN told John MacArthur, as John MacArthur was complaining about the war, this was in the middle of it, he said, Saddam Hussein must be watching this right now with great satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> I think Saddam had more things, better things to do than watch CNN while the bombs were falling nearby. Absolutely. Jim, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us, and I'm looking very much forward to... Uh, reading this book from cover to cover, and folks, you can read it too. It's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, probably just about any fairly large bookstore, and you can go to my website and get a link to order it online. It's at harrybrown.org. Just go to the radio page and the radio links page from the radio page. Jim, thank you very much. Good luck with the book, and I hope to have you back again sometime. Hey, thanks so much for your kind words, Harry, and thanks for having me on. It was fun. My pleasure. Well, as you well know, you couldn't possibly miss it. This last week was the two-year anniversary of 9-11. And, of course, we heard so much pap this week, just as Jim Bovard said in the last hour, uh, things like George Bush saying they hate us for our freedoms, our democracy, and our prosperity, and you're either for freedom, which means you do what I say, or you're against freedom, which means you want to be free to do what you want to do. And this two-year period has been a very unfortunate one in American history, but it is not unique. The same sort of thing happened 
at World War I. The same sort of thing happened at World War II. And to a certain extent, it happened during the first year of the Korean War until Americans just got pretty sick and tired of that war, which eventually went on for three years total. But we hear so much about this, and as Jonathan pointed out, everybody seems to think history started on 9-11, and it didn't. And when I heard about the 9-11 attacks that day, I think it was a Tuesday, September 11th, everybody will remember where they were when they heard about it, like JFK's death. And I remember where I was. I was in bed asleep, and my wife came and woke me up and told me that I might want to come downstairs, watch television, see what was going on. I immediately sat down and wrote an article called When Will We Learn, which was published on World Net Daily, the big Internet publication, basically conservative, but does present some other points of view. And it appeared the next day, September 12th. And I look back on that article, and I don't find anything in it that I'd want to change. And so I thought maybe I would just read it to you now and see what you think. Does this still make sense? When will we learn? The terrorist attacks against America comprise a horrible tragedy, but they shouldn't be a surprise. It is well known that in war, the first casualty is truth, that during any war, truth is forsaken for propaganda. But sanity was a prior casualty. It was the loss of sanity that led to war in the first place. Our foreign policy has been insane for decades. It was only a matter of time until Americans would have to suffer personally for it. It is a terrible tragedy of life that the innocent so often have to suffer for the sins of the guilty. When will we learn that we can't allow our politicians to bully the world without someone bullying back eventually? President Bush has authorized continued bombing of innocent people in Iraq. President Clinton bombed innocent people in the Sudan, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Serbia. President Bush Sr. invaded Iraq and Panama. President Reagan bombed innocent people in Libya and invaded Grenada. And on and on it goes. Did we think the people who lost their families and friends and property in all that destruction would love America for what happened? When will we learn that violence always begets violence? Supposedly, Reagan bombed Libya to teach Muammar al-Qaddafi a lesson about terrorism. But shortly thereafter, a Pan-American plane was destroyed over Scotland, and our government is convinced it was Libyans who did it. When will we learn that teaching someone a lesson never teaches anything but resentment, that it only inspires the recipient to greater acts of defiance? How many times on Tuesday did we hear someone describe the terrorist acts as cowardly acts? But as misguided and despicable as they were, they were anything but cowardly. The people who committed them knowingly gave their lives for whatever stupid beliefs they held. But what about the American presidents who order bombings of innocent people, while the presidents remain completely insulated from any danger? What would you call their acts? When will we learn that forsaking truth and reason in the heat of battle almost always assures that we will lose the battle? And now, as sure as night follows day, we will be told we must give up more of our freedoms to avenge what never should have happened in the first place. When will we learn that it makes no sense to give up our freedoms in the name of freedom? What should be done? First of all, stop the hysteria. Stand back and ask how this could happen. Ask how a prosperous country isolated by two oceans could have embroiled itself so much in other people's business that someone would want to do us harm. Even sitting in the middle of Europe, Switzerland isn't beset by terrorist attacks because the Swiss mind their own business. Second, resolve that we won't let our leaders use this occasion to commit their own terrorist acts upon more innocent people, foreign and domestic. That will inspire more terrorist acts in the future. Third, find a way with enforceable constitutional limits to prevent our leaders from ever again provoking this kind of anger against America. There are those who will say that this article is unpatriotic and un-American, that this is not a time to question our country or our leaders. When will we learn that without freedom and sanity, there is no reason to be patriotic? Published on September 12, 2001. Well, we can invite your comments on that or anything else that you have in mind. The phones are open right now at 1-800-510-TALK, and you can also email me at question at harrybrown.org. We received a question from, not a question, but a comment from Rick in Michigan. If by definition to govern is to rule, then wouldn't it be a contradiction of terms to expect government to act as a servant, as implied by the Declaration of Independence? If an institution is formed that acts as a servant to the people, then wouldn't it make more sense to call it something other than a government or a governing body? Well, that's a good point, Rick, and I think it's important to understand that because government is forced, you can never fully reform it. You can never make it act like a business. As so many conservatives say, government should be more businesslike. Government is not a business. Businesses don't use force. If they do, they go to jail for violence. So if government is a necessary evil, it must be limited to the smallest size possible. Otherwise, we're in big trouble, as you can see all around you. Christopher writes and says, what is your view on anarcho-capitalism? Do you feel it is a workable belief? 
Also, how big would the U.S. armed forces be under a libertarian government? Anarcho-capitalism is a term, I believe, coined by Murray Rothbard sometime, I would guess, in the 1960s to describe the viewpoint that capitalism should reign and government should be either non-existent or so tiny you can barely be aware of its existence. And my attitude towards this is that we are so far away from such a state that all I want to do is to see us stop going in the wrong direction and start going in the right direction. And I don't mean by cutting 10% off of one government program, but by making wholesale cuts in the federal government and any other governments I'm affected by, such as the city of Franklin, Tennessee, or the state of Tennessee governments. But if we do that and we eventually bring, say, the federal government down to its constitutional limits, then we will be so much better off than we are now. We may be satisfied and we may all forget about politics and go back to just enjoying life, but some of us may want to go on at that point and make government even smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's all right with me because government is force, and I would like to see force eliminated as much as possible from human existence in the United States of America. To whatever extent we can take it, that is fine with me, to whatever extent we can reduce it. And so I wish anybody well who wants to try to work towards a state of no government or minimal government or whatever it is. We're so far from that point right now, we shouldn't be arguing over it. We should be just trying to figure out what to do. The other part of Christopher's question was, how big would the U.S. armed forces be under a libertarian government just big enough to defend this country from invasion? No bigger. We'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. Good evening, Jock. Good evening. What's on your mind tonight? Uh, in regard to this terrorism nonsense. <laughs> okay. And the uh, insane desire to get us involved in uh, the takeover of the Mideast oil interests, of which the Bush family has considerable holdings. Uh, when the truth comes out about 9-11... It is going to be so different from what you're being told now by the media psychopaths of the Bush administration that it will be absolutely horrendous. I can't say what it is right now, but it's exactly opposite from what you're hearing. Well, it's an interesting thing about that because if you raise this possibility that the Bush administration had warning of this or in any way Not was, just warning, Harry. Not was just well in any warning. way was let's say derelict in protecting the American people, whether by active interest or by passive interest, it sounds completely crazy and off the wall, but the same thing would have been true if in 1942 you had said, you know, our government knew the attack on Pearl Harbor was coming, or at least an attack on some American outpost in the Pacific, and not only that, they did everything they could to make it happen. That's, that's true. And but, that is true. But uh, 20 years later, it began to be common wisdom that this was the case, and now it has reached the point where almost no historian will deny it, but the historians will say, well, Roosevelt had to do it, but they admit that he did do these things. And that may be the case with the 9-11 thing at some point, and I'm not saying it is because I simply don't know, but at some point it may be that what seems insane right now and paranoid will turn out to have been absolutely true. Yeah, well, at any rate, we are headed towards dictatorship. I'm not talking about Saddam Hussein. I'm talking about our own so-called government right here. Backyard. Well, we just keep moving in that direction inch by inch every single day. And if you don't do what you're told, you'll get the same treatment that they handed out to the dis dissidents in Iraq mm -hmm. and other, other nations. True. So we have one of the greatest threats in American history coming over our heads. But it ain't these dictators in other countries. It's our dictators right here, homegrown in our backyard. Well, take hope. I can't promise you that everything's going to turn out all right, but it isn't inevitable that it will turn out all wrong. So do what you can, stay alive, stay alert, and try to... Make your voice known where you can without too much danger to yourself. And who knows? We just might turn this thing around at some point. Already the skepticism is greater in many circles now than it was six months or a year or two years ago, and we can be thankful for that and hope that this is a trend that's going to keep moving in our direction, even as the government is moving in the opposite you direction. You know how bad the situation is when you get a liberal, like what's his name, Dean? Oh, yeah, Howard Dean. Dean, trust to the top. And I'm, I don't know if it's on the level or the usual uh, behind-the-scenes uh, hanky-panky. But when you find him being thrust to the top and becoming so popular over George Bush, that is very telling. It shows that the American people are, are looking desperately for anybody who will save them from the, what, the upcoming mess that Bush is dropping on our heads. Yeah, it's a, it's a good analogy or a good metaphor. Uh, Dean is, does not have the charm of Bill Clinton, but he is every bit the opportunist that Clinton was, and he saw the opportunity to jump upon the skepticism, especially from people in the Democratic Party who are going to be the voters in the primary. They will be the ones deciding whether he gets the nomination, not Republicans, conservatives, and other people. So he's jumped on that, even as he says that now that we're in Iraq, we should stay there, and we should also be going to Liberia, and we should be going to all these other places. But as an opportunist, he has put his finger to the wind and realized that this is the time to start talking about how Bush made horrible mistakes and put the American people in danger. Thanks so much for calling, Jock. 
I received a nice email from Bill, who is listening to us on KZNG in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And he also asked, do you have any opinion on the candidates for the LP 2004 presidential nomination? Well, to the best of my knowledge, the only one who's running a real campaign so far is Gary Nolan. He has a campaign manager. He is doing as much media as he can, traveling. He set up a campaign committee. He's collecting donations. He's doing everything he can to hone his message in as many public forums as possible. And in other words, in my view, he's going about it the right way. I'm not prepared to throw my support to him or endorse him yet because it's still a little bit early. But the Libertarian Convention next year will, instead of being in its usual July 4th weekend, will be on Memorial Day weekend at the end of May to provide for a little longer general campaign season after the convention. But I really wish that one or two other candidates would get in the race and hold, uh, conduct real campaigns. There are several others who have announced, but they're not doing the kinds of things that are necessary. I think that a lot of candidates get into the presidential nomination race in the party thinking if they go to some state conventions and make an impression on the libertarians there, some of whom may wind up being delegates to the national convention and voting on the nomination, that they can get the nomination and then the party will give them some money to campaign and so on. But it really doesn't work that way. I started my first campaign, the 96 campaign, in August of 94. And I was traveling immediately, uh, visiting wherever I could, lining up as many public appearances. I was auditioning for the job, in effect. But I also knew that as a libertarian presidential candidate, even if I wasn't the official candidate yet, there were forums available to me that wouldn't be available as just plain old libertarian Harry Brown. And so I took advantage of this to be able to speak in a lot of places and do as much outreach as I could. And by the time the convention came around, two years later, I was the only candidate that had actually done anything. And so as a result, I won the nomination fairly easily on the first ballot, getting about two-thirds of the vote. And then after the campaign was over, in early 97, I formed an exploratory committee, which is a committee you set up like a campaign committee, but you have not officially committed yourself, but you're able to raise money and do things. And again, I did as much as I could over the next few years and then started the campaign officially in February of 2000. But by then, everybody knew that I was, at least everybody in the party knew that I was going to be running. And by then, I had had dozens, if not hundreds, uh, well, probably scores of radio and television interviews. I had appeared at a lot of public functions. And so then from February, right on through the convention, I really bore down and was doing many, many shows a week. And this is what a candidate has to do if he's going to use the presidential nomination as an opportunity to spread the libertarian message. And as I said, the only one who's doing anything in that direction so far is Gary Nolan, and my hat is off to him for doing that. Bob Moore writes to ask, I'm interested in your thoughts regarding Megan's Law implementation in the U.S. to track sex offenders. If I understand Megan's Law correctly, it is that when a sex offender is released from prison, it is the duty of the police to notify everybody in the neighborhood where he is going to live that he is a sex offender. I do find this offensive. I think that two things happen. It makes it very, very difficult for this person to reform and start a new job and a new career and a new life for himself because everybody around is going to say, well, he's a sex offender. I'm not going to give him the time of day. I'm not going to give him a job, whatever it is. And, of course, some people say, once you're a sex offender, you always will be. You can't possibly reform. It's something inside of you. Well, if that's the case, why don't we just take him out and shoot him? But nobody is really suggesting that, at least not that I've heard. The second problem with it is if anything does happen, this person can easily become the subject of vigilante action, of people saying, well, we know who did it, uh, we know who molested that little girl, or whatever it is, or this little girl is missing, uh, he must have, have her tied up in his basement or something, and God knows what's going to happen to this individual. I think that anybody who has served his time should have all of his civil rights restored to him. He should be able to vote, he should be able to own a gun, because he can be marauded he can be terrorized by thugs on the street or in his home just as much as anybody else can and he should not be made the subject of opprobrium uh, by the police in his area it's a ready-made opportunity for the police to harass him robert also asks is it your opinion that we should withdraw from our positions throughout the world and focus on our borders if we are going to spend millions should we post the military every hundred yards along our north and south borders no all i think the military should be doing is protecting us from invasion and if somebody is really going to invade the United States, they're not going to do it by sneaking across the border. They're going to do it by sending a fleet to land troops on either our west coast or our east coast, or they're going to take some position in Mexico, some military position, and come across the borders there. But you're certainly going to know about it in advance, and the military can rush to protect them. We also should have a missile defense system to protect us from the many people in the world who could get their hands on a nuclear missile. And no, a missile defense system will not protect you against every possible threat to the United States. It also will not make a peanut butter sandwich for you. But it would certainly end the threat that somebody is going to get his hands on nuclear missiles and send them to the U.S., which is what kept this country in thrall 
for 45 years and justified all sorts of invasions of the, our civil liberties, all sorts of, of huge defense spending, not defense spending, offense spending, military spending. And if we'd had a missile defense, it would have been harder to sell those ridiculous toilet seats and other expensive items to the American people as necessary to protect us from the Soviet Union. So what we should have is a strong national defense that might cost this country something like $30 billion a year. We don't need the national offense, which is now approaching $400 billion a year. Dave in Minneapolis, Minnesota, said he heard a couple of tidbits on NPR this week about how government programs spawn more big government. And at the end of his message, he says, my girlfriend would like to know what's a good libertarian like me doing listening to NPR. I told her that I give them a donation every year. I pay for it. Well, I listen to NPR. It's the only radio station I listen to around here. Uh, I do because it's the only classical music station around here. And as a result, I wind up hearing some of their other programs as well. And I am surprised that they are providing both sides on a lot of issues. I don't think the government ought to give them any money. And an interesting story about that is that during the last campaign, I went to the NPR station here in Nashville. It used to be owned by the Public Library of Nashville. It's WPLN, I think is the name of the station, meaning Public Library Nashville, PLN. And I went in, and they had this huge new facility. And I thought, oh, my God, look at all this money, probably 90% of it coming from the government, from through the library system or something. And when I got into the room with the fellow who was going to interview me. I said, boy, this is quite a facility you got here. And he said, you know, it's an interesting thing. We were owned by the public library for so many years, and we were in these dumpy, run-down facilities, and we finally went private. And we separated ourselves from the library and became an independent station, supported by sponsors, you know, the ones who say this hour brought to you by so-and-so, and by private donations, and now we're flourishing. So sometimes it helps immensely to get off the government dole. Anyway, Dave said that he heard two examples of big government spawning big government. One was the story about how foreign tourism to the U.S. has declined 20% since September 11. In response, the Bush administration has created a special agency to promote foreign tourism to America. Of course, this is while the State Department is heavily grilling and scrutinizing foreigners who apply for tourist visas to the U.S. Gee, the State Department's recent actions make it a bigger hassle to visit us, and so W has to create an agency to compensate for this predictable consequence. And then he goes on to say the other tidbit was from earlier this week during the coverage of the protests against the World Trade Organization meeting in Mexico. According to one segment, during this coverage, a lot of third world countries are concerned about the fact that a lot of them don't have much to trade to richer countries other than agricultural products. However, because the U.S. heavily subsidizes its own farmers, third world farmers have difficulty competing in our market because their governments, their governments can't afford to subsidize them. So what does the U.S. government do to help the countries whose trade competitiveness has been hindered by our big government agricultural programs? What does our government do? Big government foreign aid, of course. Excellent examples. As I said on this program a few weeks ago, <laughs> and I have been saying over and over again for more years than I can remember, government is good at one thing. It knows how to break your legs, hand you a crutch, and then say, see, if it weren't for the government, you couldn't walk. Well, let's go to the phones again and talk with Keith in North Dakota. Good evening, Keith. Hey, Harry. How are you this evening? I'm great. Good. I'm glad you're with us. What's on your mind? Uh, well, I uh, wanted to inform you of another presidential candidate. All uh, right. His name is Michael Bednarik. Yes. He's running a pretty good campaign. Uh, tell us what he's doing in the way of outreach to non-libertarians. Well, uh, he's going around uh, from different cities, and, uh, well, yeah, I'm not sure uh, what exactly is, as far as non-libertarians go, but he's been speaking at quite a few different libertarian events. I know, and I think he has uh, some Constitution classes that he puts on for um, libertarians and non-libertarians alike. Um, I saw his debate on C-SPAN with Gary Nolan that was taped at, I think it was the Missouri LP convention, and that was in June, I guess, and they showed it on C-SPAN a month later. And he seemed like a very nice fellow and very interesting. The problem I had was that he was giving a lecture on the Constitution, a scholarly academic lecture on the Constitution, rather than a hard-hitting speech talking about how much better your life could be if we would only do A, B, and C. And that's what I like to see in a candidate is somebody who gives you a reason to want to support him or other libertarian candidates or just simply open your eyes to what's happening. Very true. Um, got another thing, too, Harry. Sure. A second. Um, what do you think um, about all the, the smoking, the anti smoking war that's being uh, going on and uh, all the cities and states are trying to pass smoking bans and uh, I know Fargo in particular they um, there's a group out there that wants the city commission to ban all the smoking in uh, bars and restaurants now I feel that I think it should be up to the bar owner or the restaurant owner to decide what they want to have in the bar it's not like somebody is holding a gun to the heads of the patrons. Nobody's making them attend the bar that allows smoking, so why don't they just choose a bar that doesn't allow smoking? I have to interject here something. You know, sometime back, New York City, under Michael Bloomberg, that good Republican who believes in freedom, because he's a good Republican, 
arranged to outlaw all smoking in public buildings, meaning in office buildings, in bars, in restaurants, or any place where people congregate. That is, in other words, other than somebody's private home. And the interesting thing is that the people at the U.N., the United Nations building in the heart of Manhattan, refuse to obey this law. They will not go along with it. And so I hereby take back every bad thing I've said about the United Nations over the last 50 years. <laughs> the only one standing up for freedom against this tyranny in New York. And another interesting point I might make about that is almost invariably, once the government gets into the act, most people forget that anything ever happened before the government got in the act. And government is good at taking credit for things that happen in the free market and for taking uh, the blame and shifting it to the free market for anything bad that happens. And People don't realize or have forgotten that before these anti-smoking laws were passed, restaurants had already started segregating into smoking and non-smoking sections. I resented it at the time because it just seemed like political correctness, but it was not a government-ordered edict anywhere in the country, to the best of my knowledge, except maybe Santa Monica or Berkeley, which is always ahead of the curve. But it was just done voluntarily by the restaurant owners because they had come to realize that a lot of people don't like smoke in the area, and so they took the obvious solution and just segregated the smokers. And people who smoked and didn't like that, didn't have to go to these restaurants. People who don't smoke and still thought that the air was contaminated somehow by people in the next room smoking or across the room smoking could not go to that restaurant and go somewhere else instead. But then the government had to get into the act and start outlawing it. In one city after another, it has become illegal to smoke in bars or restaurants. And in New York, they've gone all the way and outlawed it in office buildings. So uh, what do I think about anti-smoking laws, Keith? Can you guess? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I knew what you would think, I guess. But uh, yeah, and it's funny, you know, they, one of the arguments, too, is about workers' rights and the right to breathe clean air. Well, oh, yeah. I kind of feel that it's my right to breathe, but it's not really my right to breathe clean air. I, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, any right that you have wouldn't even be called a right unless it was preventing somebody else from doing what he wants to do. In some cases, we think it's very logical. I have a right to life, therefore we should prevent other people from killing me. But I don't have a right to a job because that forces somebody else to provide a job. I don't have a right to be able to work in a certain kind of environment because that forces somebody else to provide it. And you can go on down the list for anything that doesn't have to do with defending you against violence. The rights are not rights at all. They are special empowerments that are done at the expense of somebody else, and they are certainly contrary to the American way. Keith, we're about out of time. So I'm going to say thank you very much for calling. And to anyone else who didn't get in, please call earlier next week. I said earlier that I was going to answer the question about my thoughts on how the U.S. should deal with Israel and the Palestinians. Palestinians, I completely ignored this until now, and so I'm running out of time. So I'll give you the short answer first, and that is we should have nothing to do with it. It is not our business. It was a terrible mistake to wrench that property out of the hands of people who had it and carve out a new nation. This has been done all over the world, always with bad results. After the First World War, they rewrote the map of Europe and created whole new countries like Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia and others and strung together people who had nothing in common, and all that has resulted from all of this is violence. There is no solution to the Palestinian-Israeli problem, and any president who says there is and has a roadmap to peace is giving you false hope. Rather, he's giving himself a reason to dispense more of your money and to interfere more in other people's affairs and put your life at risk as a result. I do not condone what terrorists have done. They're going about it the wrong way also. But to think that they are just stupid or they have no grievance or that they are... Uh, just insane is ridiculous. Thanks so much for joining me. This is Harry Brown. We'll be back next week at the same time. Have a good week.